a science story, huh? Is NYU a scientist? They, I it felt, felt, I felt right. right. I was so and I just happy. thought, well, I figured it out. It was that golden moment. Because science was on my side. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Story Collider, where we bring you true, personal stories about science. I am your host, Aaron Barker, and this week we're presenting stories about the sense of touch. I was doing a little bit of research online in preparation for this episode. I think you can probably all tell that my podcast hosting is typically very thoroughly researched. But I came across this quote from a neurobiologist named David Linden in an article on Vox.com called Nine Surprising Facts About the Sense of Touch, which is super interesting, by the way. Shout out to the author, Joseph Strongberg. But in this article, Dr. Linden says, you can't turn off touch. It never goes away. You can close your eyes and imagine what it's like to be blind, and you can stop up your ears and imagine what it's like to be deaf. But touch is so central and ever-present in our lives that we can't imagine losing it. It's deep, right? So on that note, our first story today is from Sushma Subramanian. It was recorded in February 2018 at Busboys and Poets 5th and K in Washington, D.C. The theme that night was Unbeaten Path. We break up the weekend before I move. My boyfriend Karthik and I have gotten into yet another argument, this time about where to go eat. He has suggested a meaty Chinese restaurant on the Lower East Side of New York. I'm vegetarian, so my interpretation was, he does not care about me. Yes, it was stupid, but it was just like many others that we'd been having over months, ever since I had been offered a job teaching journalism at a university south of DC. Karthik had supported my decision to take the position, but as the move came closer, it became clear he was becoming reticent about joining me. And we had been talking about marriage, so this spooked me. That's what our argument was really about. It was not just that I couldn't eat Don Don noodles. Uh, about 12 hours after we had um, decided to go our separate ways, uh, I called my parents to tell them the sad news that Karthik and I were no more. <laughs> uh, they also knew about our plans to get married, and they had told their relatives in India all about it. And uh, they had been freaking out about arranging my marriage ever since I was 23. I'm 32 now, and they're convinced that Karthik is my final option. <laughs> and I'm blowing it. What will we tell everyone, they ask? At the end of this conversation, I am exhausted. Not just from the conversation itself, but also because of weeks of back and forth with Karthik uh, and a decade of familial pressure. So I turn to Karthik and I say, let's just do it. Let's get engaged. He looks really sorry for me. And he says, Okay. <laughs> so two days later, we go to one of our favorite restaurants in Brooklyn, and we have a nice dinner. Then we walk over to Prospect Park, and under a tree, we propose to each other. This is the story that we tell everybody. We leave out the parts about his freak out and our breakup and my desperate plea. A couple days after that, I move to Fredericksburg, Virginia, alone. I'm in a long distance relationship with my fiance. As I'm sitting there by myself, I start to wonder, did we jump into this? Did I force Karthik into something he didn't want to do? Was this all a huge mistake? But I don't tell him any of this. Instead, I talk about how much fun I'm having with my students and uh, getting to know my colleagues and checking out Pinterest pages with ideas for our wedding. Um, while all this is going on, uh, I have been working on this book about the sense of touch. 
and uh, I've been doing my research. And uh, touch is fascinating to me because it involves so many innate abilities in our body. There's movement. There's uh, an understanding of position. There's the feeling on our skin and our emotional reactions. Um, There's also more interest in touch lately because of uh, the field of haptics, which is focused on doing things like building robots that can feel and um, adding more tactile interaction with our technology. Uh, Touch was an unexpected subject for me, mostly because I've never really liked it that much. Um, When I was growing up, my dad used to call me a touch-me-not after the fern that folds in on itself when it's stroked with a finger because I would shrink away whenever he came too close. I still freak out a little bit when I get touched. I'm not crazy. There are people I do like to touch. I like to touch Karthik, but I think it's my... (laughs) I think it's my fear around touch that drew me to this subject. I think it takes someone who has such a strong visceral reaction to touch to notice it because it's a sense that so often operates in the background of our consciousness. For my research, I had gone to the World Haptics Conference in Chicago where I met some Northwestern engineers who had built these devices called T-pads And they were basically um, tablets and phones that were enabled with special touch effects. So a person might feel, um, say, the lines of a grid on the screen. Or if you put your finger down in a drawing application, you could actually feel some texture. This was done by altering the vibration pattern on the screen depending on where it was touched. It was all really interesting. But the creators themselves wondered, What could this be used for? How could this really enhance the relationship that we have with our devices? And so they had suggested that I take some phones and play around with them myself. And I'm hoping that by doing this, maybe I can help them figure out the answer to their questions. I get the phones a few weeks into my new job. And my next trip up to New York to visit Karthik during which we're still snapping at each other because we're not talking honestly. I give a phone to him, and I pose it as an experiment that we're going to conduct together. By sending each other haptic images, maybe we can figure out what touch is even good for. That first week, he sends me a couple of interesting photographs um, of the wood grains of his desk at work and the lines on the palm of his hand. Um, A program on the the phone uh, converts these black and white images into a textural pattern, depending on how they're shaded. Um, It's kind of cool to feel. But to be honest, it's not that compelling. And after a few rounds of back and forth, we, we stop because uh, it's kind of annoying to carry around an extra bulky phone. At this point, I'm, I'm feeling kind of dejected. It's, I guess my experiment is not working, and perhaps the conclusion is that haptics are not that useful. So I end up talking to a new colleague about my situation. He's a computer science professor. And together, we come up with an idea. Maybe the problem is that we're just exchanging uh, static images. What if, instead, I was able to touch Karthik virtually in real time? It turns out that my colleague's son, who lives in Austin, in his spare time develops smartphone apps. And he says he can create one for us. A week later, it's ready. And I try it out with him at first. So he puts his finger down on the screen. And what I see on my end is the image of a heat map of his fingerprint. And uh, when I put my finger down on it I, and then move it across, I feel a slight haptic bump. It's kind of amazing how much a a tiny change in the vibration can actually feel like it's warping the shape of the glass. But after I do this for a few more seconds, I have to stop. I am creeped out. It feels as strange as if 
I were actually fondling a real stranger's <laughs> finger. I don't know him well enough to ask him if he feels the same way. Uh, so instead, I tell him thank you and get off the phone really quickly. <laughs> Uh, a couple days later, Karthik gets that phone in the mail, and we try it out. At first, our fingers meet up at the center of the screen, and uh, we kind of rub them against each other. And then I move my finger away, and he follows me. I dart away, and, and he tries to catch me again. I let him catch me, and we keep our fingers there for a moment, and then they start nuzzling each other. We are flirting haptically. <laughs> it's a very subtle effect, but it's surprising how moving it is. Uh, it's the first time in a really long time that we've allowed ourselves to connect. And um, it's a reminder that I think we both need that we need to spend more moments like this enjoying each other's company and not overthinking everything that's happened between us. It's not like the relationship immediately changes after all of this, but we do start talking more honestly. And we realize that we wouldn't have actually stayed broken up. The reason we were so comfortable proposing to each other after all of that had happened was that we knew we were going to get back together at the end. A couple months later, he got a job not too far from me, and then we moved into our first apartment together. And then soon after that, we got married at a public park in Oakland, California, surrounded by friends and family. I still get teary-eyed thinking about that day when I was sitting in my room, feeling Karthik touch me, not in person, but mediated through a screen. When the words weren't coming and our relationship was at its most intense, it was through touch that we were finally able to express ourselves. Thank you. That was Sushma Subramanian. Sushma is an assistant professor of journalism at the University of Mary Washington, where she advises the staff of the campus newspaper, The Blue and Gray Press. She is also a freelance magazine writer focusing on the intersection of science and culture. Her work has appeared in Discover, Slate, Foreign Policy, and many other publications. Her book on the sense of touch is forthcoming from the publisher Algonquin. Before we move on to the next story, I wanted to let you know that the Story Collider is planning on launching regular shows in a few brand new cities in 2019. And so we're looking for talented producers to add to our team in Dallas and Chicago and potentially a few other places as well. Our producers are the ones responsible for booking and coaching our storytellers and hosting the shows, and we pay them on a per-show basis. We just held our first-ever team retreat a couple weeks ago on the Jersey Shore that ended with a massive 22-person group hug, and so I can tell you that being a part of this team is basically the best ever. Plus, we've got hoodies that say producer on the back, which I think we can all agree is very fun. So if you're interested, please send us an email at stories at storycollider.org, and tell us why you think you'd be a great member of our team. Our next story today is from Nick Anderson. It was recorded in January 2018 at the Oberon Theater in Cambridge, Massachusetts. The theme that night was Heroes and Villains. So when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes, there are a couple of things that the endocrinologist is going to make you know before you're allowed to leave the pediatric intensive care unit. For starters, you have to be able to explain what it is that diabetes is. As you'll notice, I'm no longer in the pediatric intensive care unit, so this is something I accomplished when I was 11. <laughs> when all of you, and I don't know if any else out there is diabetic, if you are, Beatty's pride, and if you're not, let me explain. When all of you eat food, your body is able to digest it properly. Your islet cells, which live inside your pancreas, produce insulin, and then the insulin allows your body to break apart uh, the energy molecules and the carbohydrates of the food that you're eating and absorb that into your bloodstream and send it out to your assorted organs so that you're able to live. My body decided when I was 11, or really rather when I was 10, going into 11, that my islet cells 
were a disease that had to be eliminated. And because I have very effective white blood cells, eliminated my islet cells were, they no longer function. So the first thing I had to be able to explain was what diabetes is, which is so I can be able to be in control of my story. And I've just explained to you what diabetes is. The second thing you have to know how to do when you are in the pediatric intensive care unit with type 1 diabetes is be able to inject yourself. As I mentioned previously, my body doesn't produce insulin. So I really like food. I like eating. Uh, but in order for me to eat, I have to have insulin inside of my body and I don't make any. Uh, my parents and I had to all learn how to inject insulin. I take two different kinds of insulin. I take a short acting insulin before I eat food. It allows my body to break the stuff down. And then I take a long acting insulin before I go to bed so that I can be at a stasis. Um, in the hospital when I was 11, the nurse presented an orange as a practice item and told my parents and I, try injecting this orange. Think of it like a dart. My mother, who is very squeamish and not much for darts, <laughs> impaled that orange <laughs> with a syringe full of saline water. And it was at that moment that I decided no one else in my family would be handling the insulin injections. <laughs> which was important to me because along with control of my story, I wanted to be in control of my body. And the third thing that they make you know before you leave the pediatric intensive care unit when you're diagnosed with type 1 diabetes is how to treat high blood sugar and low blood sugar. Blood sugar, short of it, it's the amount of blood glucose in your blood. It's the gl glucose is the energy that travels on your body. And because again, as you may recall, I don't produce insulin. If I don't have a proper level of blood glucose, uh, there are some problems. High blood sugar, you can treat through a variety of ways, but mostly you take insulin. You take more insulin, you correct it, you go on a run, you work out, you do something to sort of get rid of the excess energy, the excess, excess, excess glucose in your body. Low blood sugar is a little bit scarier. Uh, it's sometimes harder to detect, and it can lead to some pretty weird side effects. It depends, it's different for everybody and it comes to different places. For me in particular, I've discovered in the years since I was 11, low blood sugar leads to um, an innate sense of paranoia, um, a sense that everyone is out to get me, that everyone knows I'm a diabetic, everyone assumes I've failed in some way, and uh, everyone is judging me. So in practice, um, I hide, uh, occasionally I kick, uh, I've been known to bite EMTs, uh, why that seemed like an effective strategy of avoiding detention, I can't say, but low blood sugar me is very focused on getting away from everything. And this was important to me to know how to use highs and lows because I really wanted to be, con be in control of my experience. I didn't want anyone else to know what it felt like to be diabetic. And, and for a while, it was really easy for me to have any, no one know. I was really good at taking care of my diabetes for 10-ish years, nobody really noticed. I had friends all the time say, oh, you're a diabetic, I wanted to give you some cake. And I would eat the cake and I would just take more insulin, um, which in afterthought is not the best way of handling type 1 diabetes. But uh, it, it seemed like I was really on top of it. I should back up and, and there's another way of treating low blood sugar that is even more terrifying than low blood sugar itself. It's called the glucagon. It's perhaps the longest needle I have ever seen. And in the pediatric intensive care unit, they just whipped it out and were like, so if you're ever really low, you should tell everyone around you, your friends and loved ones and roommates in college, that they can just impale you with this. <laughs> and then that will revive you. <laughs> I've had a glucagon in my life ever since then. And uh, I'm, I may have the same glucagon because if it's expired, I don't want to know because I don't ever want to use it because I was in control of my blood sugar and I would never get that low. So as I move on in life and my blood sugar stays more or less level, um, it starts to become a problem in college. Not for any particular reason. I mean, alcohol might have something to do with it. And, um, <laughs> changing metabolisms and changing habits might have a little bit else. But throughout college and then further into my adult life, I realized there's a fourth thing that I never learned in the pediatric intensive care unit of Beaumont Hospital, is what to do when you have a low blood sugar reading when you're having sex, which is something that they should not tell an 11-year-old, but they should definitely tell a 25-year-old. 
I can provide some examples. <laughs> a guy I dated in 2014 kept wondering why any time we tried to have sex, I would just get really distant and, and far away. And he was convinced that I wasn't that into him. He wasn't wrong on that count, but he also <laughs> didn't realize that every time we tried to have sex, I had drank so much beer that my blood sugar was just plummeting downward. The next guy I dated seriously, things were going pretty well, and we went to this party once, and I took too much insulin and drank too much gin, and then all of a sudden, I was in the hospital, and we broke up shortly after that, because he was kind of afraid of, like, everyone loves gin. If this is what's going to happen, like, <laughs> I'm out. And then I met Luke. I was at a weekly potluck. It was this thing that happens every Sunday, people together and have food, and it's really quite lovely, but Luke was a regular, and pretty soon after, I became a regular. And because I'm pretty thick-headed, I didn't quite realize that he was asking me out or hitting on me, but he kept trying, and so eventually we went out. And he was nice. He's a far nicer person than I am, and I was confused for a while why he continued to want to date me. <laughs> because I kept being mean to him, ignoring his text messages, and just generally being a horrible person. But he stuck through it. And so we started dating kind of seriously. And we were at this party, not long into our relationship, and I had some beer and not enough food. And so later on in the evening, when we went back to Luke's apartment, um, we got naked and started making out, as you do. <laughs> And then I blacked out. And the next thing I knew, the, Luke's room was full of these admittedly very good-looking men who all probably could have gotten it, but they were EMTs, so they were interested in other things. And there was an IV in my arm, and I was wearing my boxers, which I hadn't been when I was asleep, which was kind of confusing. And I was just... Either Luke had engaged in some sort of very peculiar sex game with me, or... I had passed out, and, and he had called the ambulance. By this point, there was enough... My blood sugar had risen enough that I was able to refuse service at these, from these very good-looking EMTs. <laughs> and they left, leaving me there with Luke, who by this time was fully dressed. <laughs> and I was really afraid. I thought about... If that had happened to me with someone I'd been dating kind of casually, and, you know, they had just passed out, uh, in the middle of sex, uh, I would have left. That would have been it for me. I mean, I would have revived them, but... <laughs> revived them enough to say, like, it's been fun, maybe don't call me anymore. <laughs> but Luke looked at me, and he grabbed my hands, and he said, you know, I don't want that to happen again. And I said, well, I definitely don't want that to happen again. And he said, no, you don't understand. Tell me what I can do so that that doesn't happen again, so that I can help you not have that happen. And I thought about the pediatric intensive care unit and how I wanted to have control of my story and I wanted to have control of my body and I wanted to be in charge of my own experience. And here was someone who wanted to share in my story and cared about my body and who's, who wanted the experience for both of us to be something that mattered. And it just, I didn't know what to do. But I, I told him about glucose tablets and we talked about grapefruit juice and we got to a point where... <laughs> We would never have to call the EMTs again. And I was at my, pedi at my endocrinologist, not pediatric anymore, I was at my endocrinologist the other day. And she said, you know, you haven't had any catastrophic lows in a really long time. And I just, I want to know what happened. Uh, in my fridge right now, there's a glucagon, that very long needle, uh, that definitely expired about five years ago. It's behind the cat food, and it should stay there uh, indefinitely. But I have a better sort of treatment for a little blood sugar, and it's Luke. We moved in in May, and uh, being with him has been the best blood sugar uh, fix that I could have possibly asked for, and for that I'm forever grateful. Thank you. That was Nick Anderson. Nick is an audio producer and podcaster based in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and you can check out his podcast, Ministry of Ideas, now. A Detroit-area native and a proud graduate of the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, he promised his colleagues at WGBH's Masterpiece that he would definitely mention them in his next public storytelling bio. He works there. He mentioned it. You're welcome, Bruce. <laughs> 
The Story Collider is grateful for the support of the Tiffany & Co. Foundation and of Science Sandbox, a Simons Foundation initiative dedicated to engaging everyone with the process of science. The Story Collider is directed by Liz Neely and Aaron Barker. That's me. Without from our amazing team. The stories featured in today's podcast were from shows produced by Christine Gentry, Ari Daniel, Mariam Zaringhalem, and Shane Hanlon, with help from Katie Wu. The podcast is produced by Zoe Saunders. The theme music is by Ghost. Special thanks to the Oberon and Busboys and Poets for hosting these shows, and to each one of our amazing producers who make these shows happen. Thanks for listening. Thanks for listening.